Harry has given interviews publicising his new book to ITV, CBS and Good Morning America. They've all been trailing clips before the book goes on sale next week. Now, in these clips, Harry begins by describing a fist fight with Prince William. What was different here was this level of frustration. And you know, I talk about the red mist that I had for so many years. And I saw this red mist in him. He wanted me to, to, to hit him back, but I chose not to. There's a fair amount of drugs, marijuana, mm -hmm. magic mushrooms, cocaine. I mean, that's going to surprise people. But important to acknowledge. I want reconciliation, but first there needs to be some accountability. The truth, supposedly, at the moment has been there's only one side to this story, right? But there's two sides to every story. One of the criticisms that you've received is that, well, okay, fine, you want to move to California, you want to step back from the institutional role. Why be so public. You say you tried to do this privately. And every single time I've tried to do it privately, there have been briefings and leakings and planting of stories against me and my wife. You know, the family motto is never complain, never explain, but it's just a motto. And it doesn't really hold. There's a lot of complaining and a lot of explaining. And private being done in through leaks. Through leaks. They will feed or have a conversation with the correspondent. And that correspondent will literally be spoon-fed information and write the story. And at the bottom of it, they will say that they've reached out to Buckingham Palace for comment. Mm. But the whole story is Buckingham Palace commenting. So when we're being told for the last six years, we can't put a statement out to protect you, but you do it for other members of the family, there becomes a point when silence is betrayal. What Meghan had to go through was, was similar in some part to what Kate and what Camilla went through. Very different circumstances. But then you add in the race element, which was what the press, British press jumped on straight away. I went into this incredibly naive. I had no idea the British press was so bigoted. Hell, I was probably bigoted you, before you, the relationship with, with Meghan. You think you were bigoted before the relationship with Meghan? I, I don't know. Put it this way, I didn't see what I now see. The quote in this book where you refer to your brother as your um, beloved brother and arch nemesis. Strong words. What did you mean by that? There has always been this competition between us, weirdly. I think it really plays into or is played by the heir spare. So fights with the heir to the throne, cocaine, um, and yeah, this continued warpath with the royal machine. He thinks they're constantly, um, or they were constantly, leaking against him and his wife, Meghan Markle, a lot to unpack. It doesn't seem, you know, particularly good for the royal family. That is, unless you are the BBC's resident royal spokesperson. Sorry, I mean royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell. Um, he had this to say. The irresistible appeal of all of this, um, the media gorging on it yet again across all the front pages, and here we are leading our bulletins for a second day running. At some point, I suspect many people will tire of this, and I think, uh, you know, we also need to consider what's not in the book, which is certainly, I suspect, what the palace will be weighing up. There are, uh, after all, no, as it were, irrecoverable lines that we're aware of on racially inappropriate language or behaviour. Think back to the Oprah Winfrey interview. That was the big issue that emerged there. I'm not aware that that has been taken forward in this book. There are no irrecoverable lines, actually, I think, on Camilla. Yes, um, the boys asked their father not to marry her because they feared that she would become a wicked stepmother. But she did not become the wicked stepmother, according to this book. There are no criticisms, serious, significant criticisms of her. And there are no, I think significant criticisms of their father in the way that he did his job as Prince of Wales or as he's doing his job as king. So I suspect that the palace will be weighing this up clearly and will be feeling that, well, yes, this is uncomfortable. Of course it is, but we have, if you look back 30 years, we have been here before dealing with interviews and books and we can weather this and we will get on with the job. We've been here before interviews, books, Clearly a reference to Diana. Like, he really speaks with the voice of the royal family. These pesky people giving interviews where they lay bare what's going on in the royal family. You'd have thought as the royal correspondent, you'd quite enjoy that. Don't you, don't you want to know what's going on inside? It's like, ah, oh, this pestilent Prince Harry. 
yeah, which was thing about, well, I think people are going to get bored of this eventually. It's like, hold on. Your job is to make sure they don't get bored of this. You're the royal correspondent for the BBC. Yeah, I think people have had enough of the roars. <laughs> you talked about the television for 25 years. A very surreal moment, right? Enough of the royals. Oh, yes, isn't that wonderful? The queen, of course, yes. Well, she's got a history of wearing matching green hats and you know, blazers. The most inane stuff. But apparently, you know, the, the brother of the next king of England, you know, having, having a fight. It's not a big deal. It doesn't matter. I found the fight thing kind of strange. Brothers fight, Michael. Brothers do, yeah, brothers have physical fights. It's not good. I'm not celebrating it. I'm not saying, oh, you know, it's, you know, it's immaterial. Sometimes they have fights and it's like, you know, awful. But brothers have fights. I mean, that's what brothers do. I, I find that a bit strange. Like they had a physical altercation. Okay. I mean, is that, that, is that so unusual? Or, you know, he's done mushrooms and cocaine as a 17, 18 year old in Britain. Okay. That makes him quite normal. It's interesting that that's the stuff that leads. And then as Witchell says, there's no sort of irrecoverable sort of PR catastrophes in terms of a later rapprochement, which is interesting, right? Which I think suggests this book is about selling book, you know, it's about selling, or this endeavor rather, is about selling books, you know, making money, raising media profile, being able to have an independent sort of media and, and financial existence from the, from the royal family for, for him and Meghan. But then, like you say, or like Nicholas Witchell says, rather, uh, keeping, keeping doors open for, for later on and coming back together again. I mean, brothers have fights. Families fall out all the time. Is that so strange? The idea that you know, the brothers didn't want their dad to marry Camilla. I mean, I have found this whole thing bizarre, Michael, because you know, Camilla and Charles were shagging while Charles was still with their mother. I mean, the fact they even talk to her is, I think, a real positive reflection on both of them. In a normal sort of family, this would be just really, really weird. The idea that both the, the sons of a woman who basically her life was torn apart, um, and that was partly enabled by her husband, who at the same time was openly sleeping with somebody else, and apparently they're meant to love this woman now. Come on. If, that was, if, that, if your dad did that, first of all, you'd think he was an asshole. Which this is another thing. All these people bleating on about how Prince Charles, in, including the Guardian, how Prince Charles is suddenly such a wonderful role model, so much better than the Tories. Look, if you're a dad of two kids and you're humiliating their mother in public and you're sleeping with another woman openly, and everybody knows about it, no, you aren't a role model. I don't care how wonderful you are on the climate crisis or what you were going to go say, you know, cop in Egypt. Let's start with the basics, right? And don't raise your children like that. It's interesting that he he says that stuff and then he doesn't go all in, which again is a credit to him. Let's see, Michael. Again, we we need a real expert on these things, not Nicholas Witchell, Ash Sarka, Ash Nasarka, to prize apart the really important uh, aspects of this book. But on the one hand, where I said that the candor around Afghanistan was useful, and I think that's that's a political point. I think the stuff about a seventeen or eighteen year old man taking cocaine and having a punch up with his brother a bit later on in life. I think that's mundane, to say the least, when it comes to, you know, how most people in this country live their lives. Mm -hmm.